Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> hey, thank you for uh, getting up early to join me here, 9.30. I know there was a session before this, 8 o'clock. Were all of you here at 8 o'clock this morning? That's really impressive. That's awesome. <clears throat> See, we still have a few people coming in. We're doing a slow start here, so just come on in from the back there. There's plenty of room. Um, so you've heard about Visual Studio, obviously. And you've heard about AI because it seems like we won't shut up about it. So um, this is what we're going to talk about today. Something about Visual Studio and how AI fits into the whole story. And even more importantly, what does that mean to you? We are very well aware that, you know, we don't get everything right the first time always, right? You, some of you have been with us for a long time and you, you know that that's definitely true. And... Um, we have a great session on that tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. Uh, Dahlia will talk about like how our experience uh, building AI into Visual Studio and what to watch out for if you want to roll out your own AI implementations in your own apps and so on. So that's a really interesting perspective from, from like inside uh, the Visual Studio team on working with AI. So that's tomorrow at eight. But here I just want to talk about like how, what's our approach when we think about AI? Where have we stumbled a little bit in the past? And where are we going? And what does it mean for Visual Studio? Uh, and, the, and the other features that has nothing to do with AI. That's important too, right? So um, we are also very acutely aware of, of this thing called uh, AI fatigue, right? We keep hearing about it. We, we talk about it all the time. And uh, I don't know if you remember this, but like a decade ago or so, maybe a little bit more, 15 years ago, you know, .NET developers, Visual Studio developers, all of a sudden, everything was about Azure. Anytime you went to a conference or read a blog post, it was about Azure this, Azure that. It was like, hey, I just want to write my console app. Why do I, you know, there was this push and it was it was just maybe too much, it felt like. And so we we're well aware that this AI might be the same thing, right? So we, we kind of try to find our place, you know, and we, we stumble a little bit getting there. Um, but I want to take this time to just take a step back and bring it down to earth a little bit and say, well, what is it that we really try to do with AI? Come on. All right, $5 Amazon device. You can do it? Nope, all right. What? There we go. Okay, so maybe this works now. I just had to use the mouse for some reason. Okay, so the way we look at this is that, uh, with AI, we can redefine what a 10x developer is. So this is kind of an interesting uh, perspective, I think, because uh, it's all about productivity at the end of the day, like how much quality can you produce, right, as an engineer. Uh, and part of it is like keeping you in the zone because there was this um, survey they came out uh, two years ago by software.com. Do you know how, long an average developer you spend a day coding? Five hours? <laughs> that was closer than five hours, yep. 52 minutes. The rest of the time is spent by reading code, reading documentation, emails, meetings, and so on. So 52 minutes, right? And only in the top 10 percentile codes for more than two hours a day, like writes code. Just think about that, that's crazy. So when we talk about like keeping you in the zone, right, writing the code, being productive, we don't necessarily mean help you write code. It could be reducing the other things you do so that you can have time to write more code or write the same amount of co code, but leave work early, however you wanna see it. Um, so less distractions, less ceremony, less burdens, and then more focus on what really matters, our app, our accuracy, the quality, the logic, right? The thing that, the thing that we became developers for in the first place, being creative. Okay, let's try it. Yes. All right. So we talked about why in the past year and a half, like why do we want AI? Um, and it, it's time that we, we, we move that over to what? Because now we actually have history, now we have features out, we have products out and so on. So what is it that we're talking about? Where are we going with what's coming next and so on? So here's one thing we did in Visual Studio. 
we made it easy to name things. So, you know, the two hardest problems in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things. So we solved naming things. And we shipped that in Visual Studio earlier this year. And it's fantastic. It's, it's really phenomenal in the way it does things. And it can, you can only do this with AI. It might seem like a small thing, right? But given that it is one of the two largest problems in computer science, we can now check that off our list. And we can move on to the next major problem in computer science. There are just a category of problems that we have not been able to solve before AI, or that we haven't been able to solve completely or to you know, the full extent that we want without AI, because it requires an understanding of our code base or something like that, that we just can't do from like a static or a semantic um, point of view. We need sort of an understanding of the whole context. And that's where the AI comes in. So naming things was, was a great example of that because it does go in and it looks at how do I use the variables, the classes and all this sort of stuff in my code for it to be able to come up with a list of names that would be good, okay? You cannot do that without understanding how things are being used. So you can't just semantically go in and look at C-sharp tokens and so on in a semantic model and come up with a list of useful names. You need more than that. <clears throat> so breakpoints is another one, <clears throat> or debugging features in general. Uh, where we added a way to maybe teach and show how to use more advanced features of the Visual Studio debugger. So let me ask you a question, hands up. How many people here wish they were better at debugging? A lot, all right, thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> so this is one of those, those superpowers. Uh, you know, there's always someone on the team that's fantastic at debugging. Someone is better than everybody else. And you know, when you're giving up, you're going to that person to ask for help. Can you please look at this and why, you know, and they bring out like WinDBG and they can do all sorts of deep stuff and loading modules and um, all types of words that, you know, <clears throat> maybe we don't use and we don't know how to do these things. So when we talk about 10Xing developers, we're talking about not having the need to go to that one person that's a superhero on the team for debugging because we can make you one. So, and that, that takes many forms, right? So here's one example where, well, how do you use like specific conditions and breakpoints? How do you take advantage of these features that we already have? And we can have AI look at the context you're in and suggest what might be some uh, plausible things that you'd wanna do. And so not only do we look, teach you about the syntax going on, but we can speed up that process and make you uh, solve your problems faster. This is also something that's shipped recently. Here's another one. I think we're shipping that next week. Or did we ship that? Yeah, next week. Um, so the idea is here, some, sometimes you get errors that are not exceptions. So it could be you're calling a Win32 API, right? And you're getting like an integer back, like an error code. Like, well, well, what is that about? I don't know this stuff, right? And I get an error back. Um, so what caused the error? Well, what if we could ask the AI to kind of analyze and figure out what in my code caused the error and then provide a fix for it or a, a, a different code path so that I don't end up with this error. Could be a logical thing on my part, right? Again, I don't have to ask that debugger person on the team. I can figure it out on my own. And the same thing with exceptions. Well, you get a null reference exception or any type of exceptions. Well, why is that? If you can't tell what it is, well, maybe Copilot can analyze the, your entire project and figure out what was it right here that caused this to occur and how can we fix it. This is actually one of the most used uh, Copilot features in Visual Studio today. For good reason, right? We can, we can see how we can use this a lot, a lot uh, in pretty much every app we built. Oh, by the way, feel free to, uh, you know, Raise your hand and ask questions as we go along, okay? Uh, profiling, how many people here use the profiler? I expect maybe two hands. Okay, a little bit more, five. Uh, this is one of the most fantastic features in Visual Studio. And I know that you don't use it. So I feel that's a shame because this is really a fantastic tool to find 
bottlenecks and you know over consumption of memory and so on in your apps. Um, so if you really want to you know talk about performance and and all that type of stuff, you need to use the profiler. It's in the pro it's in the community. It's included, and we can add Copilot to that too because. Knowing that something has a hot path, like, oh, I'm using a lot of you know, extra memory here in this link query I'm using here. Well, what, what is it about the link? Is it the link statement itself that's the problem? Or is it that I'm iterating over a collection type that is the wrong type? Should I have used a you know, hash set instead of a, you know, whatever? Uh, that can be hard to know just by knowing that, hey, this line is taking a long time to execute. But with Copilot, we can ask it, hey, what is it specifically here that made my app slow? And how can I make it faster? And you get the code for it, and you just insert, and boom, that's it. So a fantastic combination, right, where we have the kind of the static tooling or whatever, the, the non-AI tooling finds the issue, and then the AI brain finds the solution. So that's a great way of, of kind of using it where, where we have a like a two different aspects, if you will, uh, to come together to solve the problem. And again, we couldn't, we couldn't do the solution really without the AI, again, in this example. So it's something, it's a, it's a, so we see it as a part of a solution. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's all the solution all the time, but it's part of the story and it helps us solve problems we could not solve before. Here's another one. You've seen this also in other uh, apps like VS Code. Um, AI generated commit, me commit messages, right? So this is one where I, I, for sure, I'm guilty in you know just typing very basic stuff like updates. That's my commit <laughs> message, right? Someone is laughing, so I, you do the same, okay? <laughs> right? Or minor tweaks or something like that. We see that all the time. Um, but you know, you can just click a button now, and it will do the right thing, and it will be very detailed as well. So this is just one of these small little things where, yeah, it's not really solving any big issues here and now, but it makes the quality of what I'm doing higher, right? And the reverse of that is, hey, what if I do have, what if you are to look in the Git history and you're gonna see a commit from me and it says minor tweaks? Well, what ha actually happened? Well. We can have Copilot reverse engineer that commit message to, to explain to you, well, what exactly was going on in this commit? Like just in plain English, like give me a sentence that explains what this commit did. Yep. It is, no, so the question is, is it just the commit message or is it um, based on the diff? It bases it on the diff. Yeah, so it's able to analyze the, the delta between before and after and uh, the diff and that's how it writes the commit message. And that's also how it explains what a commit did afterwards. It looks at the diff, exactly, which is pretty cool. Here's an interesting one. The inline chat uh, has these slash commands. You write a slash and then you get like commonly used things. For instance, doc, which means document this, and it writes xml.comments. Seems pretty basic, but actually very, very powerful, really easy to use. The thing about the inline chat is that it's, you know, it's a UI that can be used for anything. So a lot of the UI we have, we know we have a lot of stuff in the chat window. We know a lot of people don't use the chat, right? Because it's not in your workflow. Um, but it's a place where we can put all sorts of arbitrary things. We don't need a new button for everything. For every new feature, we can just add it to a chat. So it's a, it's a nice place to put things but we have been overusing it, I will say, and uh, you'll see more th stuff coming into kind of more natural workflows. Like if you if you go back and, and think about that commit message, there's a button that says generate commit message, right? Super easy. It's in your workflow, it's right there. So that's that's the more natural way of, of, of looking at this and, and you'll see more of that coming. But for now we have these um, slash commands that gives you a bunch of commands right where you are and you can, you can document things, you can learn, it can explain things. Um, just kind of shortcuts to things. Really nice, fun to explore. You can prompt, you can do your own prompting in there. So you can write whatever you want. Tell, ask Copilot to do whatever you want for it. I really like the, the the documentation because I'm not so good at keeping that up to date. How about this scenario? You're about to commit something at the end of the day, 
You're like, oh yeah, let me just run the unit test before I do that. And boom, some unit test fails. You didn't write it. You didn't change any code in what you're about to commit that has anything to do with that unit test. And now you spent like over, you know, you're late home for dinner because you're sitting there and you have to send that PR and you're waiting to figure out how to fix that unit test. And, you know, it's not your code, it's hard to do. But with AI, we can now ask it, well, what about this thing in my Git history could have affected the outcome of the unit test? So it actually can go in and look at the, the your Git history and the code that has been changed along the way, not just from you, from any one on your team, and see whether or not any of that touched any code path that had to do with anything in that unit test. And so instead of spending two hours, you spend two minutes. Super powerful stuff, especially when we need it in those cases, right, where it's really hard to, to figure it out. So that is uh, that has shipped. Either it's shipping next week or it's shipping. It has just recently shipped. All right. By the way, all these images are um, Bing, Bing created them, the AI and Bing. There is a one picture where there's a lady who's got three arms. So I won't tell you which one. You'll have to find it. All right. So <laughs> <laughs> when we're looking at where, where do we want to be in the future when it comes to AI? Where one of them is like, how do we make it easy for you to take advantage of AI in your own apps? And you know, you can imagine that this all happens at coding time. You're writing code in Visual Studio and maybe Visual Studio can identify some patterns in what you're doing or the intent of your app, understand some things and hey, you're doing something that, you know, AI, if you, if you did something, there might be an opportunity for you. And the whole point is if we can do that while we're coding, then it's kind of part of our inner loop. It's part of our workflow, right? We don't have to, it's not an afterthought. It's something we can be aware of while we're coding the app. We don't have to make the decision then and there necessarily, but we're made aware of it proactively. That's the key without being annoying. I mean, let's be honest. We, we don't want any big flashing things or toast messages or yellow bars or anything like that, but some sort of mechanism to, to let us know that, hey, there's an opportunity here to do whatever you're trying to do in a very cool way. That's beneficial, right? So that's one aspect. So the AI, so one thing is, of course, that we have all the NuGet packages and the .NET libraries and whatever, the services on Azure and, and wherever we might get our, our AI from, you know, but the, the other aspect is Visual Studio can help uh, alert us to, to these things. So here's another one for, especially for the enterprises with compliance. This is typically something that happens after the fact. All right. Privacy, security, accessibility, so on. Oftentimes, those are not things we think about while we're coding. There are things that someone else is dealing with after the fact, like between we're done coding and shipping of the feature. And that's really not the greatest thing in the world, like especially when it comes to security, for instance. We want to have that as early as possible, right? But privacy, increasingly so in the last decade, has been one of those aspects that we really wanna be upfront about it. And that's another aspect where we can come in early, using AI to understand what's going on in your context, and maybe come up with some ideas or flag some potential security issues in your code while you're coding. Or accessibility. Because we have the tools, you just you manually have to run them. For like, for instance, we have the accessibility checker for WPF, right? So if you write a WPF app, you can run that, and it will tell you where you have issues. But it's an you know, if you don't think of doing that, you're not going to do that um, that those checks. And so it's about like how do we get that in and find that just as a natural part of our workflow proactively using a little bit of a push model. So instead of you having to pull to go out and know about the tools and ask them for, hey, go check my code, go check for this. It's being delivered to you as needed, when needed, right? And that is also something we can only do with 
to the full extent with AI. And then this one, this was an, is an interesting one. Um, you know, optimize cost and efficiency. So we talked about like, well, efficiency performance, right? We have the profiler. One thing I'd like to see is that we'd have our, the, deep, the regular debugger when you run F5 in Visual Studio and you run your code and the debugger is attached. I'd like to see profiling happen at that point automatically, at least the lightweight profiling. So we get rid of the worst hot paths and, and issues there. But that's more, again, more kind of statically. When we think about the topology of our app, where does it run? What are the different services, microservices or Azure services or whatever that it's running with? Is there something we can do to optimize all of that as well? Let's say I have a bicep file or a, or a Terraform um, in my app ARM templates or whatever to describe my topology. Well, we might know a lot about your situation, your running app at design time, like at, at coding time and can make some suggestions to how you can improve and, and um, be more efficient. So either save money, right, or scale greater or something like that. Uh, and of course, since we're uh, in the cloud business, that makes, that makes a lot of good sense for us to, to look at something like this. And we just um, released the Azure um, agent, uh, or we demo demonstrated it at, the, at Build earlier this year. So you see how it's, it's starting to come in. All right. Any questions? Yes, sir. May AI be used to look at build processes? Absolutely. For uh, like GitHub uh, workflows or ADO pipelines and so on. Yeah, exactly. That That's included in this. Yes, that's exactly right. I, I should have mentioned that here. Exactly, all that stuff. Are there any missing opportunities? There are so many different apps and um, things we can plug into our build pipelines to, to do all sorts of validations and checks. Are there any missed opportunities? Can it automatically suggest those, add those, check for accuracy and, and so on? Uh, maybe even generate those workflow files, right? Or pipeline files. Okay, so let's change gears for a little bit. Because one thing is, um, AI, and what we're doing, where we're going. Another thing is all the other stuff. Because, you know, at the end of the day, we're coding. We're writing code. We're typing. So, you know, we need to have a good editor. We need to have good experiences around what it means to be a developer. And it's not all AI. And AI is not everything, right? So this is not something we are, we've been sharing. This is kind of new for us. So. We're kind of realigning a little bit in what we're doing with Visual Studio. And we're seeing our mission now going forward as being something that drives success for you, our customers and partners, by creating the most lovable experiences for C Sharp and C++ developers with the emphasis on lovable. Okay, it's, it's crucial because we cannot be successful, Visual Studio cannot be successful unless you are successful. So your success is our success, if that makes sense. And we've been talking to you all for years and where we are now in the ecosystem of different uh, options with you know, VS Code and other editors out there and Visual Studio is that we think this is what we need to focus on. We need to make it so that when you spend eight hours a day in Visual Studio, it's like your second home, right? You're spending more time in Visual Studio than any other app maybe. And, and sometimes more so than you, with your family, you know? And it has to be a fantastic place to be. And so paper cuts, silly workarounds, annoying things, slow performance, all that stuff is like horrible when we spend that much time. So that's kind of where we're, we're setting out from. We know that we have a lot of work to do, of course. But we're doing it with uh, four focus areas. So AI and Copilot, that is a main area. Then we have .NET, right? And now Aspire, of course, is part of that story. So .NET. And then C++. And under C++, we have a lot of gaming. Visual Studio is actually one of the biggest gaming uh, development environments out there. 
both for AAA game studios, um, but also for hobbyists. And then the fundamentals, and that's that's kind of the one I'm mostly interested in. Fundamentals means performance is good. We don't have paper cuts. You know, things work as expected. We're we can have certain uh, we're productive and so on. And this is what we need to make sure that we deliver on. Visual Studio love developers. That's the feeling that we need to make sure that every time we do something that this, is, this shines through. And so we've done a lot in the past where, you know, some of you have called it like, hey, we throw spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks in terms of features, and then we don't really, you know, finish them. So the idea is instead of doing MVPs or most viable products, we're gonna change that to most lovable product or minimal, sorry, minimal lovable product before we ship anything. If we wanna test something, do an A-B testing, it has to be with a lovable intent. Right? It has to be something we think, this is now in a state where not only does it function, but you get excited to use it. You love using it, even though it's not finished. Right? So that's called a minimal, minimal lovable product. So it's really where, so before, I don't know, we didn't really have a specific North Star. We didn't really have stuff like this to aim for. It was more like we had a bunch of customer requests for features. We had the business that we need to take care of, make sure that our partners, you know, we had good tools for Azure and for GitHub and, and you know, the, our business, if you will. But this is now the thing that supersedes all of that. So, some uh, performance is, is something that, you know, you tell us every single time that is very important to you. So let me just show you a couple of things that we've been doing recently. Build acceleration for .NET projects. So .NET builds significantly faster now. We started with .NET Core, and now it also for .NET Framework. So you put a little, um, you put a little uh, uh, property in your CS proj, and you're going to see a significant build time decrease across every time you build. Control Shift B or F5 scenarios are significantly faster because of this. And I think actually it's now, it's gonna be turned on by default. So you don't even have to do that CS proj tr uh, trick anymore. The Git branch switching is something that people have been complaining about for a long time. Like it takes a long time when you switch branch and it has to reload the whole solution and all that stuff. So what we've been doing recently is that we've figured out how to heuristically determine whether we need to reload the whole solution which projects have to be reloaded, which individual files have to be reloaded, and only do the necessary reloads for it to work. So instead of doing like unloading the whole solution and then loading the whole thing. And that has uh, resulted in significantly faster branch switching. And then of course we got other stuff like, you know, the dev drive that has a 30% faster IO. Uh, there are a bunch of other things we can do to, to make uh, these scenarios faster as well. Open close solution, another one. You want to make sure that when you open a solution, it's it's fast. So that's something we continuously work on. It's a metrics that we get reported. It's something we report up to our VP every month. Like what are, what's our time? Because we, we actually ship uh, Visual Studio three to four times a week, in case you were wondering. It is not like just a three month exercise, it's three to four times a week uh, with all the service releases and community pro and enterprise and so on. So there's something to report on, on a monthly basis. And so we look, at, we look at this and we are making great improvements. F5, so regardless of the build acceleration, F5 is now just faster. I think you got, in the last update, you got 20% faster F5. It has to do with how it loads and, and starts your process and so on. Um, external source decompilation. Again, if you are debugging something and you're stepping into external source, that is now much, much faster. Before you had to like kind of wait and had to load the modules and your, or the symbols and you were waiting for that. And now it's like very snappy. Again, it's part of that inner loop, part of like not being in your way. We, that's the last thing we want Visual Studio to be in your way, right? We want to be uh, as, 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 not as, you know, as, what's it called? As quiet as possible, no noise, keep you in your zone. Um, here's that performance profile I was talking about before. So 
for those of you who have tried it um, in the past and you know maybe your hand wasn't up because you don't use it anymore because it was so slow right so you would how you use it is that you start the profiling session sorry you you run your app as part of starting the profiler and then when you've done this you know the the walkthrough in your app that you want to measure the performance of you stop collecting you click a button so stop collecting for the profiler and then it kind of Gets, gets all the information, all the memory, and it presents the result. And that could take a long time. In fact, it took such a long time, se several minutes sometimes, that you didn't do it very often. It became an afterthought. It became something you did after the fact or when you had performance problems. But now it's so fast that it can be part of your inner loop. So part of your you know, test, coding, writing, uh, cycle, debugging cycle, because it's so fast. So instead of just always running F5, just run it with profiling every now and again. And you can, you can be upfront about any performance issues that you might find. Any WinForms people? Yeah, okay, got a few hands, eight hands or so. Yeah, so a lot faster WinForms designer loading. So that's great. So WinForms Designer, you know, we, we moved over to .NET Core, because you can do WinForms in .NET Core. So the designer had to be in .NET Core, but Visual Studio is written in .NET Framework. And so that's gonna be out of process to work. And, you know, that whole thing has been streamlined. So much faster uh, result from that. Not everything is about like just Visual Studio being faster. It's sometimes about Visual Studio adding a feature that makes you do things faster. And so one of those was the quick add item. So when you add a new file, a C-sharp class, for instance, most people go into the add new item and they find the class template and they, they give it a name and click enter. And, and that's how they do it. Quick add item have you, gives you a way to just type foo.cs. And it knows, oh, CS, that's C-sharp. And it's foo, so that's probably a class. So I'm gonna give you the class template, boom, done. Uh, tomorrow morning at 9.30 in here. Uh, I'll, I'll show you a demo of how this works and show you just how cool it is. It does more than you might think it does with folders and all sorts of things. So uh, once you've done this, there is no way back. This is one of those features that it might not seem interesting or important, but once you, once you use this, you will never go back from it. it. It has that kind of stickiness. All right. Any questions to the performance thing? Speaking of performance, oh, yes, sir. Did you say web forms? Wind forms in Visual Studio 2022. Uh, the question was, it they don't doesn't play nice with the latest version. Yes, it does, and it plays really nice. In fact, it's faster now than it's been in a long time. If your experience uh, tells you otherwise, I want to hear about it. So, okay, well, so today at lunch, we have this table topic. So just to round off the performance thing. And uh, my table topic is uh, Visual Studio pet peeves. So this is where you, if you want to, you come and you tell me what, you, what your pet peeve about Visual Studio. Right. And we take notes and hopefully we can fix it. Uh, it's basically kind of an airing of grievances, you know, Seinfeld uh, type of situation. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. But I know there's gonna be a lot of performance um, grievances being aired there. So uh, just an opportunity to come tell me about those things at lunch. So here are some things. So I said the fundamentals were kind of where my heart is. That's where I think we get most bang for the buck where we're not looking at specific uh, like Aspire things or AAA gaming scenarios, but what are the scenarios that matter to all of us all the time, multiple times a day? We've had paper cuts. We don't even know we have issues because we kind of just taught ourselves to work around it. And a lot of times when we're, when we're faced with a fix to one of those things, we're like, oh my God, I can't believe it. I've had this issue for 20 years and I never thought about it. And oh my God, life is, life is great. What a time to be alive. That's kind of the reaction that we see again and again, not for all of these, but for generally speaking, when we're doing these quality of life improvements, some of them so small but they mean so much because you spend eight hours a day um, banging your head against some of these without even realizing it. So here's some things that are coming. 
So some of the things that, we're just, that we've, we've done and some things that are coming. So solution-based color themes. And, uh, and as an aside here, uh, this is the new um, settings dialog. It's not a dialog anymore. It's just a tab with all the settings. So, you know, we used to have that little thing. There's a little golf clap up there. Okay, I'll take it. Thank you, sir. Um, and of course, it's themed. So one of the big complaints is that the tools options window is, is horrible. Uh, but now it's right here. And not only can do we have just settings as usual, but we can create settings that live and roam with our solution. You can check it in and all your colleagues get the same settings or don't, and it's just for you. But that means any setting pretty much can be specified for each project, including a color theme. So a lot of people, they want it so that, you know, they can tell the difference between their different open visual studios, right? Because they have different apps or different solutions loaded. And now you can, along with all sorts of other things, because it's just, the settings just roam with the solution. Very cool. And one thing that we're fixing is that when you change the theme, if you notice that the font size always go back to the default, um, and which is really annoying when you go, if you switch between, let's say, dark and light theme. But uh, that's being fixed so that we are decoupling font sizing from theme selection. So uh, that makes it a little bit, uh, that makes it a lot more smooth to do this. Um, and if you can't wait for this, or if you want something that also takes into account your Git branches, then I'll show you that tomorrow morning, how we can between, sometimes you have multiple Visual Studios open with different branches of the same solution, right? Same repo. How do you make Visual Studio different colors uh, based on that? Not necessarily theming, but like other ways we can differentiate it. And there is. <clears throat> yeah, so here, here we see the old <clears throat> uh, dialogue. And now when we look under fonts, we see we have well, we used to just have bold, but now we have strike through, italic, and underline. So something that people have been complaining about for years, why we never had those options, even though it was supported, of course, under the hood by WPF and so on. Any extension could do this, but you could not, as a user, select to do that. I do that for comments. I put them italic. I think it looks fantastic. Here's another one. <clears throat> Image hover preview. Whether you use you do a web or Windows or desktop, whatever kind of development you're using, if we can find an image reference in the text file, the code file, and we can find that image on disk, and you hover it, you get to see a preview, just like this. Pretty sweet. And for those of you who write Visual Studio extension, you might know what that known monikers.rss that is. There's Visual Studio ships with 4,000 icons. All the little icons in Visual Studio ships in Visual Studio, they're all SAML icons. So vector graphic, high, high quality. You can use all those for free in your own apps, by the way. You can distribute those for free in the Visual Studio image library. But they're called known monikers. And if you use those, you can also get your little preview. Kind of cool. So this one came out in like about 10 years ago in Web Essentials, the free extension for Visual Studio. And people have been asking for it to be built in ever since, and now it is. So this one shipped in the previous update. Here's one, the before and after. So before, you're, you're typing quotes, and you get like that double quote, like don't give me that closing quote because I'm right next to, you know, and kind of see the problem illustrated in the, in the gift to the left. <laughs> Um, so this was fixed in the spring. Uh, we had a long discussion about it on the, this is actually the .NET team that had to do this, but this is on the Roslyn side. JavaScript didn't have this problem, C++ didn't have this problem. This was a pure Roslyn problem. And so the fix was actually done on, uh, on the Roslyn repo on GitHub. And we had a long back and forth and Twitter was involved and people were commenting on all sides. And there's a difference between what is accurate and what is the best sometimes. And this is one of those cases where, well, technically, you may want to, if it's inside a method, uh, a method signature, and you want, like, let's say a construct constructor, for instance, you may want to add some quotes to something, and you, you know, technically it's accurate, and you, you, something, something. It's like, yeah, but that's not what people do, right? 
this is not the main scenario, so let's just fix it. And it, that, and we ended up coming up with a really, really good solution that satisfied the people that really wanted accuracy, which Rosslyn is very much about accuracy, right? These are the compiler people. Um, they wanted accuracy, and you know, then there was kind of me and other people were like, well, we're like the human side of things. We want the human behavior thing, and and I think we landed it in a good place. So that shipped. There's another one. Other editors have this. So when I say fundamental stuff, I mean like, hey, it's things we expect from other editors, VS Code, you know, others. Um, we want to make sure that we the muscle memory carries over to VS. And so here's one where you, you know, you want to do a quote. You select some text and you want to surround it with quotes. And now you can just do your selection and hit your quote or your back tick and it or your parenthesis and it automatically closes it. Um, a big ask from you for years. If you've used Visual Studio for many years, this might not be what you want because your muscle memory is just different. But if you're like going back and forth between apps, this is probably what you would expect Visual Studio to do. No applauses here, so old time Visual Studio good. users. Good. Okay, good, all right, all right. <laughs> Feel free to uh, like raise your hand or uh, you know yell me down or whatever if you have any comments or questions as I go here. Then there's this. Uh, all apps seem to use control forward slash to toggle a line comment, comment on, comment off. And Visual Studio had this feature, but no one knew about it. So control K, control forward slash. I, it, it baffled me, why did we select that keyboard shortcut? So, so I, I was asking the team, why did we do this? And they were like, yeah, I don't, they don't remember why it was. Because it's not like it was used for anything useful. Uh, and so we dug out like old, like years old email threads about things. And it was just one of those things that just, just slipped through the cracks. You know, and in the meantime, it became this industry standard <clears throat> that control forward slash should be the toggle of line commands, uh, comments, sorry. And so we fixed that. So now you can use both uh, the old keyboard shortcut and the new. So your, key, your muscle memory carries over from let's say VS Code to VS and vice versa. Small little things, right? <clears throat> you might like this one. Have you ever tried to copy from the error list to go search in Google or whatever for the fix? And it just copies all the rows and it's annoying. So now, as of next week, Control C gives you just an error description. <laughs> Oh, wow. That was the biggest applause so far, right? This just goes to prove that it's sometimes it's the little things, right? The quality of life. So uh, super, uh, super excited for that. I can show you that one tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow I have the tips and tricks uh, session. So um, we, we can go into detail about all this stuff coming. The question is, is control C also being used for copying from your locals and watch windows and stuff in the debugger? Right now, control C copies the whole line, including variable values, whereas there's a separate copy value, but it's not default for control C. So it's the same. So right now it does the same thing. I'm just kind of paraphrasing you. So in the debugger and the watch windows and locals, it also copies, control C copies the whole line instead of just the name of the variable. Uh, no, it is not. And I've actually not heard uh, any requests for that, but that seems like if that's the same scenario as this, it seems like we should do the exact same thing. Anyone in here have the same issue with the debugger and the, okay. All right, you're not alone, it seems like, okay. Yeah, let's look at that for sure. It, I mean, it's a trivial fix. It's just getting it done, right? <clears throat> All right, docking of the code surge window. Another small thing, well, maybe not small from an implementation perspective, but small in the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, so when you control T to search or use uh, the quick search up in the top, you know, the, or control Q for the feature search, you can now dock that so it's always visible, always shows up in the same place. A long time request from people. Is this, is this useful? Eh, eh, okay, all right. Yeah. I'll try it out, all right. Yeah, 
Apparently, it's something that a lot of people have been wanting. So it, it has a lot of votes on our developer community. That's how we do a lot of these things, by the way. So if you go to help, send feedback, request a feature in Visual Studio, we, they go straight to the team. They go straight to me. They go straight to my colleagues. We look at them. And that's how we do a lot of these. These features are because, hey, here's something that has a lot of votes or you know, it's, it's getting popularity. Yes, sir? Oh yeah, so here's, yeah, so that's a good comment. So this is great because after an update, it shows up on random monitors. So depending on your, your monitor setup, this might, you know, your, this might be very useful. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I would encourage you to, to look at um, send feedback and go to developercommunity.microsoft.com and just look what's there and vote for it. This is literally how we do these quality of life. This is about like what you want, the paper cuts that you are faced with every day and getting rid of those. I hope that what you see here in, in, in the last bits has nothing to do with AI, right? But it's stuff we're doing alongside with AI. It is stuff as important as whatever the future means with AI in that we get all these things right. And you know, Visual Studio love developers. Like there's no way we cannot do stuff like this if that has to be true. If Visual Studio loves developers, we need to do stuff like this. Do you agree? Yes. Yeah. What do you think is more important? Fundamental stuff like this? Well, maybe not, ah, how should I raise this question? I can't say that, right? Because if I say, what's more important, AI uh, advancements or, or this, it's like, well, maybe they solve different problems for us. Uh, so um, one aspect I see where it's, there's a, a lot of this overlap. I already mentioned the profiler, right? Where the profiler finds the issue and the AI finds the solution based on the issue found by the profiler. And there's a bunch of other stuff like that. One that I really like is uh, we, I talked to a gentleman yesterday and he was, hey, it would be great if we didn't have to do so much boilerplate. I always have to write the, all these properties in a new class. And there's just a lot of ceremony involved in programming. So how can I get rid of that and just do kind of the logic, the creative work? And it got me thinking, you know, when we add a new class, whether we use the, you know, the old way or the new way that I talked to here, um, it would be great if I can somehow get closer to where I want the class to end up than what I get right now, where I just get an empty class. What if there was a way that I could say, give me a person class and then it will do that somehow, right? Or I don't, I don't know what that means, but there's something there where we can take existing features and we can sprinkle some AI on top of that gets us closer, get us more productive, closer to that 10X uh, goal of ours, right? 10Xing all of us. And so I really think that we, we have to do both. We have to do both. We can't do just over index on one without the other. Uh, and I think doing stuff like this is great. It feels good. It gets applause, right? We all love it because we're gonna enjoy it immediately when we get the next update but it doesn't move the needle. It just makes us happier. Uh, that's super important, but we need the, the needle movers as well. Right? And that's kind of where the AI comes in. So I think we're in a really, really good place. I think what our realignment to our priorities is gonna send us down a path where AI becomes this great thing that is not in our face. It's not being pushed too hard, but it's there to solve real problems that helps us and at the end makes us happier, right? So that's that's where we wanna be and that's where we wanna go. And I hope you get that sensation after uh, listening to this. So tomorrow, I'll be here, same time, same place, and we'll go over some, just some tips with Visual Studio. I'll show you a bunch of these quality of life. Um, I'm sure you know some of them, but I guarantee you, you don't know all the tips I'm gonna show you. Visual Studio is huge and has a lot of features and no one knows them all. Uh, but I know people who know most of them and I've been sourcing the best tips. So come for that one. And um, please make sure to take this session uh, survey. Danielle asked me to make sure that I ask you to do that. Um, and with that, thank you so much. Inline chat, yep. How do you effectively use that? Is it by code selection, putting the chat above or below?
Uh, let's find it. Yeah, it's really interesting. The way, so the question is, how do you use inline chat? Do you have to make a selection first, or how does it work? Well, it knows where your caret is. So if your caret is, let's say, right under the class definition, you know, public class foo, and you, your, your caret is on that line or right underneath it, your context is the whole class. If your caret is inside an if statement, inside a for loop, inside a method, then that is your context. And so if you're in there and you say comment, if you're in a method and say document you know, slash doc, it just does the method. But if you do it on the class level, it does the whole class. You can, and if you select, then that makes, then that is what you're selected. Yeah. So it's, it's aware of, of your situation, your status in the editor. Yeah. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. yep, yep. So good question. So I mentioned things are coming out. Well, how do we as developers keep up to date and know when, you know, when the new things come out and, and how do we do this? Uh, so the Visual Studio blog is a really, really important place to be. That is where we do all of our announcements. Um, so I will highly recommend you do that. We have the release notes. You mentioned the release notes as well. So we just completely revamped how we do release notes. Um, and you might have, might have seen the difference in what they look like. They're much more comprehensive now, much more easier to kind of glance over and get a feel for what's there and to go to the section you care about. You know, skip C++ if you're a .NET developer and so on. Um, but that's a source of truth. That is the source of truth is the release notes. And if you go to the help menu in Visual Studio, there's one called release notes. And there are two release notes. There's the release notes of the uh, current uh, latest stable version. That's today, that would be 17.10 of Visual Studio 2022. And then there's the preview release. So right now the preview is 17.11, preview six or something. Uh, and they're right next to each other in the, in the menu. When you go to the release notes, you can easily go to the next one uh, and see what's coming. So those are the two primary places to go. I would follow Twitter as well. So what the way we're doing things now is that we're not broadcasting on our blog anything about our previews, all the individual features. We do an announcement when it's available. And then we actually don't talk about that on the blog again until it goes out of preview and becomes a stable version. Okay. Instead, what we do is that we've taken that to Twitter. And so... A really good idea to yeah follow me on Twitter uh, is probably the best because I'm the one that, that posted. It turns out that we get much more engagement and much many more views if I tweet something out about Visual Studio than if the Visual Studio <laughs> account does it, which is weird because it has like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of followers. So that just shows that you know my, people might follow something without reading it. I don't know, but um, so that's that's how we differentiate it. But again, the release notes those are the source of truth. And they're always up to date. Yep. So I got a follow up question to that. So, because we develop in sprints and we have a period of window where we're, like, we're heading down, we don't lift our heads up to breathe until we make that goal, whether it's six months or not. So, how frequently should we check in these blogs? Monthly uh, or quarterly? We kind of keep up. And then yep. my other part to that is is there any way y'all can make, make like little cheats on Microsoft Learn? or somewhere where there's like a little bit of documentation so that we can go back because Twitter, it, it right. can get lost and yep. we don't want to build our own documentation. Mm -hmm. our, like our tribe of developers are now going to have to keep, hey, because we can have a new developer come in. Yep. They may not be coming in. We need to make sure that they know so we can keep them productive as well. So I'm just kind yeah. of that's a two-part right Okay, so the question is uh, uh, like, well, how often should we check? I don't have time to check Twitter and you know, it's all ephemeral, it goes away. But how often should I check the blogs and so on? So there are some there are some cheat codes to that. So the blog you can actually subscribe to. So you get an email every time there's a new blog post. And it just gives you, it's a very nice design of that email, by the way. It looks great. And it just says, hey, this blog post came out. And you can either say, hey, that's not a topic that interests me, and then ignore it, or you can click in and read more. So subscribe to the blog, email subscribe. That's that's easy. Just go to the blog and there's an email subscription right there. Another one is the, if you go to my.visualstudio.com. 
So that's your benefits place. So whether you use community or pro or enterprise, you have benefits. Uh, and they're listed there. And so one of them is that we have the, the newsletter. So we have a subscriber newsletter for pro and enterprise. And we have the Dev Essentials new newsletter for community. So sign up to the one that, that you have access to. And that's another great way of getting kind of uh, info about what's new. My favorite way is to install an extension to Visual Studio. If, you, if you're allowed to install extensions, there's one called Developer News. And it uh, takes the, the Visual Studio blog and also the .NET and C++ and NuGet and all the different ones that we have that are potentially relevant. And you have a checkbox next to each of them. You can uncheck if you don't care about like Azure Functions blog or SQL. You don't have to get those and you can uncheck those. And so it's just a tool window that can live right next to Solution Explorer or behind it. And you can check it whenever you want. You get a little uh, red thing at the bottom bar in the corner that doesn't interfere with you or anything. So you can see, hey, there's something new. And so at your own tempo, you can kind of read through it, sk skim through the headlines. And that's how I do it. Developer news. Yeah. Yep. Okay, cool. That was uh, over here first, yeah. When I took my Mac for this job, this is like my Chromebook computer. And I just saw yesterday that you were stopping support for Mac. And I'm wondering which of these features I could actually profit from in my personal computer, which is the Mac. So, do you use VS for Mac? Yeah. Okay. So VS for Mac uh, has been deprecated. So we're not gonna. None of these features are coming to VS for Mac. So if VS for Mac didn't have these already, it's not going to get them. So we get this question all the time. So I might as well just um, tell you like the, we made a notice early this year that VS for Mac is deprecated. And our efforts has been to move over to the C Sharp dev kit on, uh, for VS Code. All right, so that's, so our cross plat story for .NET developers is to use the C Sharp dev kit, which comes for free or comes included in your subscription. So if you're a pro and enterprise, you get you get that you can use that. Um, so um, that's the story there. So unfortunately, VS for Mac is now only in maintenance, so it will still get security updates um, and other maintenance fixes, but um, but no new features. I think it might still get updated with like the latest. Um, if you're a, if you're a iOS developer, I think you will still get the latest SDKs and stuff. But yeah, that was one. Yep. Okay, so the question is for the for the git commit messages, AI commit messages, can they follow a certain standard? Or can you specify a certain standard? There are, there are different uh, like conventions and stuff out there that people are have adopted. Uh, and also, can you link it to a work item, like ADO or GitHub work item? Uh, so the first one is no, but you're not the first one to say that, so the team is aware. And I do think that there's something they're looking at. They're right, now, right now, we're about to ship, um, uh, you know, you can do drafts and templates. So, you know, when you, when you like a commit or a PR template. So we are looking at lo those deeper integrations and customization options. They're, they're starting to roll out now. And so I wouldn't be surprised if this is something that's gonna gonna come. People have different workflows, and we want to make sure we we support them all. Um, the work item linking, uh, you can do that for PRs. Can you do that for commits? I think you can do that for commits now too. Well, you've been doing that for a long time, where you can add mention a a uh, a work item. But I'm not sure that it also would resolve it in ADO. That was your specific question. Yeah. It does on GitHub. Um, I assume it does on. Like if you say fixes hash one, two, three, it will, but that's a GitHub ism. Uh, I don't know if, if ADO does the same thing. I would assume it does. Uh, yeah. Right. Oh, and then gets returned. See, that's a that's a good one for AI right there. It's actually an, an area we, we're looking into, uh, just conceptually at least, is uh, how do we reduce the time it takes for you to fix a bug? Because that's, you know, let's face it, that's what we spend most of our days doing, right? <laughs> fix bugs that we introduced yesterday. Um, 
And so from you, it starts with you finding out what bugs to fix. And then once you know the bug to fix, you have to go back in and then figure out, well, what files was it and so on. So what if there was a way we could get you to the point where you'd make the change as fast as possible? And we've seen some stuff on github.com. They have some, some mechanism for that. But if we could get that into Visual Studio where it automatically opens the files that it knows that are relevant to this bug and so on and so on. Like, um, that is something we're looking into. What would that look like? Um, we haven't even looked at well, how can we can we do it? That's we'll figure out that later. But can we? Is there a user experience that makes sense with this? And so that's that's the state that is at right now. Uh, yep. Are there any plans to integrate some of the the power tools that have been extensions mm -hmm. for fifteen years? Right. Are there any plans to uh, include any of the productivity power tools extensions um, into VS? Yeah, we've had them for many years. <laughs> they came out for Visual Studio 2010, if I remember right. Um, mm, we did roll in. What did we roll in? The color task was one, color task was one but not fully. Uh, it's not to the full extent. Um, that, that extension died because the way the Visual Studio architecture changed. So we, unfortunately, we couldn't bring it up. So that was one that people like were screaming about, and so we had to do that one. The other extension still works. So one is the squ squiggly. If you have a, an error in a file and the file is not open, you can see the squiggly in the Solution Explorer under that file. Uh, that is not something that we have currently coming. Uh, the thing about extensions is that it's a double-edged sword because we often write extensions to test out scenarios and get your input on, hey, does this make sense? But then when we've written the extension, we're like, well, you have the extension, so maybe other things for us now is higher priority, and we should pursue that instead because you have the workaround, you have the extension, so your, your problem is solved. And so it's, it's a kind of a double-edged sword sometimes, and not till it gets to the point where the extension cannot be carried forward can we, it's like, whoa, this was important, we need to make sure that we build that in. And so that happened in the, in the tabs scenario, the colored tabs. Uh, but you know, copy as HTML, you still need the extension for uh, the squiggle lines in the Solution Explorer and, and some of the others, yeah. But they're free, so hopefully you can install them. Yep. So I have a question because the development is defined by they're worried about copilot integration. I think yesterday we asked a question that they said it's going to be copilot aiming to be enterprise only, which means if your group is an enterprise group, that copilot should be only available in that domain. Uh, I'm not. I'm not the authority of that, so we should ask uh, Brian Randall. He's somewhere. Uh, but I. I do know that there's a, an effort in GitHub Enterprise to have a, a like within that org LLM only. But to the details of that, I don't. Yeah. Right. Not to my knowledge. So, so the Visual Studio Copilot implementation. You can. You think of Copilot like you have the GitHub Copilot service. And then you have VS Code, you have the JetBrains agent, you have the Visual Studio agent sitting on top of that talking to those services, right? And so when something is implemented down at the service level, it takes a little while for the individual heads to be updated. And so it could be here or it could be under development here. That doesn't mean that we, we have it in Visual Studio yet. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, um, going back to Profiling and reducing costs and uh, you know, using Copilot to determine the issues, mm -hmm. using Copilot to come up with solutions. Um, you know, you look at a typical project now with uh, you know, going to Azure, you've got microservices, Azure functions, you've got um, service buses, all these things. Yeah. And it can be like a one solution. Is there a potential uh, possibility to do cost profiling and say, hey, look, if I press a button, this is how much it's going to cost in Azure if you have this many transactions per month with these SKUs? Because we struggle with which. Which version do we need for yeah. what we do? We spend so much time running small tests to see what the costs are. Mm -hmm. If you could just tell us right away what we're looking at, would be great. Yep. Yeah. So the question is when you are dealing with Azure services, you might have a bunch of different Azure services and you don't necessarily know like what SKUs to use or the scaling patterns. And it would be great if, if AI could help you with a cost simulation as well, tell you uh, that. That's exactly that's exactly the type of stuff I was I was talking about, would would include that. Like uh, if we know that, hey, you're using all these services, and we know that from your NuGet packages, from your bicep files and ARM templates and whatever you've got, maybe even we, you've let us uh, look at your you know, Azure. Um, yeah. And so absolutely, this is, absolutely this is one of those things. Uh, as a funny anecdote, I, had, I run a, a website called schemastore.org. 
and it serves, it does JSON schema files, and it serves 1.6 terabytes of JSON files per day uh, to Visual Studio VS Code, you know, IntelliJ, uh, Android Studio, JSON Buddy, like a bunch of editors. And it was like, it started costing me a lot of money. And I didn't know, like, if I went down a skew too low, all of a sudden the server would fall over, like after two weeks. And I, you know, and I couldn't really figure out how to not do that. And I didn't want to pay more. So I, it would have been great. I've been in that very situation, even though my situation was much simpler. Uh, but that just goes to show that it doesn't, you don't have to be, uh, like even in a simple scenario, it's, it can still be hard, right? So, so it's something you're looking at. But you yes, to yes, exactly. We have nothing to show. Well, we have, we demoed it a, a little bit in, in, at build where we have the, you know, the slash commands. We have, we have one coming that's called Azure. And you can ask it about your Azure stuff. Um, so we're, we're starting down that path. Did I see another hand somewhere? I didn't. Well, maybe there are other hands wanting to be raised. All right. Well, thanks for, uh, for joining me, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you.